Did the plays call and respond to us? Brecht's call and respond, an evening of three one acts, blends past and present writers to focus on what it takes to leave a bad situation for an uncertain future. In Brecht's The Jewish Wife, Judith is preparing to leave Hitler's Germany in order to keep her non-Jewish husband safe. Is it worth the sacrifice? Can the husband say or do anything to make his wife stay? Arlene Hutton's Sunset Point has Henson, a best-selling novelist considerably older than his Jewish fiancée Rachel, who's also a writer. He has an opportunity to buy back his great-grandfather's cottage in Sunset Point in the Catskills, but the people are very anti-Semitic who live there. What will this do to their relationship? Is his family's past more important than his future with her? Christian Idasak's Self-Help in the Anthropocene is a rather puzzling dystopian story where Joy is tidying up for this party. Her wife is a geologist who bursts in and says they, um, with dire news that they have to flee for their safety. Is there any safety to be had in this strange world they inhabit? And I thought these plays were a mixed lot. I like Jewish Wife. I somewhat like Sunset Point. Up, but but Cat Skills anti-Semitic. I'm sorry that there is the Borscht Belt. That made no sense. And I hate dystopian dramas. So I I enjoyed the acting, but I was disappointed because I usually like New Light, but I I was not that thrilled. So I'm giving this a mixed face. In Unstuck. Olivia Levine's fascinating take on OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder, as it affected her life as a lesbian, was more like stand-up comedy than a play. This is not a criticism. She's quite talented and experienced in that regard, and her presentation was intelligent and extremely informative, as well as being funny. We all learned a great deal as she spoke about growing up while having to repeat everything three times and not knowing why, and that was one of the smaller difficulties she mentioned. Her offering was a delight, replete with humor and affection, as she described what must have been a very difficult childhood. It seems her condition was not diagnosed properly until recently. It wasn't until she was an adult in college that she began to ask the questions that finally led to a successful treatment. Growing up gay is, of course, another subject entirely. Coming out stories are all over the place these days, and they've begun to sound a lot alike. I'm happy to say that's not the case this time. The addition of the OCD element made the narrative fresh and entertaining. Her presentation deserves a very happy face. Romeo and Bernadette, a musical tale of Verona and Brooklyn. Mark Saltzman has brilliantly taken this Italian, old 19th century Italian music, updated to the 60s, and you have Romeo. Now, this guy is trying to oppress his girlfriend so he can get her in bed. So he rewrites Romeo and says, look it, Romeo survives. He sleeps for 200 years, ends up in 1960s gangster Brooklyn, and he gets caught up in a mob war, and he's in love with Bernadette. That's his Juliet, but she's going to marry Tito. And it's all, it's just hysterical and funny, and the music is brilliant and lovely and made me cry and I just this is genius I mean we had the whole full press conference it's badly filmed but you know it, you can see it on our YouTube page yes uh, we talked and I actually sat next to the uh, fellow that did the music uh, arranging the orchestrator and, yeah the orchestrator and it was really marvelous the orchestration sounded like a full orchestra back there and with just four and, guys. With just four people so it's really really amazing I mean flutes and and things out of the out of and the the woodwork. acting was so good and they did such and the a, songs the music they the did, voices they did such a good job of integrating it I mean I mean, actually, it was sort of believable that he might have taken a sleeping potion and, um, you know, wound up, at, you know, so the, the suspension of disbelief was handled so very well. And, and uh, the fellow that played uh, Romeo, you know, I said in my review that I think everyone fell in love with him. Uh, you know, because certainly, and his girlfriend was in the audience. I don't know if you spoke to her at all. Beautiful and Judy McClain is in it. She, she you know, Broadway she, star. Broadway yeah. star, and she was really, really terrific. She sang a terrific song. So um, I really liked her a lot. So, so yes, yeah. so you only have this weekend. It closes February 15th, 16th. So go see Romeo and Bernadette because you will love it. And especially if you don't like Shakespeare like me, you will be enchanted. It, it is absolutely uh, a work of genius, really. And if it doesn't go on to Broadway, I don't know what can. <laughs> For Concrete Temple Theater at Dixon Place, Renee Philippi's pack rat is an animal who likes to collect human items. But when a fire is caused by a careless human, all the valley animals gang up on poor pack rat, thinking it is his fault because of its human treasures. Pack rat's BFF is Firestone the rabbit who stands by pack rat. They both decide to find Big Sagebrush, a mythical land without humans, to ensure the safety of the valley animals and restore pack rat's good graces. 
Will this succeed? Is there anywhere safe from inconsiderate humans? The recorded narration by Vera Baron told the story, but in a very slow manner. Luckily, the parrots were so intricate and fun to watch being maneuvered that it kept my attention. I am unfamiliar with Watership Down, which this story is based on, so it isn't necessary to know it to be able to enjoy this tale of learning to get along with people who may look at life differently. It's a happy face minus. It was just incredible what they did with little strips of cardboard. Dan Hoyle's one-man show, Border People, features his portrayals of various folks who have no home. I do not necessarily mean that they have no place to live. They are not, strictly speaking, homeless. Instead, Dan explores the rarely mentioned topic of existential homelessness, the lack of any kind of coherent group inclusion. Dan, both journalist and actor, has traveled throughout North America to interview people who straddle borders, oftentimes fleeing persecution in their country of origin to seek asylum in the U.S. or Canada. His journalism is impeccable. His portrayal comes verbatim from the interview transcripts. Dan is white, and most of the characters are people of color. He takes a big risk here, but his sincerity, commitment, and intelligence make any criticisms of him seem thoughtless and crass. This is an outstanding production which ran successfully on the West Coast, and I urge you to go see it as soon as you can. I gave it a, a very happy face. Nope. Oh, very happy face. Buzz McLaughlin's Sister Calling My Name deals with mental illness and the effects it has on those around the afflicted person. Lindsay is severely retarded. This is the author's words, and it was done in the 90s. I know that's not PC right now. And she's also a bit schizophrenic. Her brother Michael had to put up with her fits and see how it destroyed his parents. And 17 years later, he's, con he's contacted by someone from his past who's now a nun because apparently Lindsay is this brilliant artist and they got to know what to do about the money situation. And some interesting points were raised. Usually we just focus on the mentally ill or special needs character and don't realize what the rest of the family has to deal with or the family is noble and how they handle the situation. But... This, there were too many moments that weren't explained. It was very miscast. They were way too young to be in their 30s. And it was too intense. It was too one note. But anyway, I'm still going to give it a mixed face minus. Although my friend who's in the theater thought the blank white pages that were supposed to represent her artwork were a metaphor for the emptiness, lack of believability, and careless lazy writing the playwright. She didn't like it at all. I just, I, there were some things that were commendable. When Kaylee comes home after a long absence and announces she's pregnant, her parents, Charlie and Lise, are ecstatic. She's been living with her husband in, in Montana for several years and not often been in touch. Since childhood, she's suffered from schizoaffective disorder, a chronic mental condition characterized by hallucinations, mania, and depression. The relationship has always been difficult, and they hope her sudden appearance means she will again be part of their lives. Lance, or sorry, Lise, Kaylee's mother, is a devout Mormon. Charlie, a recovering alcoholic, has recently returned to the church after a crisis of faith. Taylor, his brother, who also serves as the narrator, is the family's success story. His two daughters, who appear only through the original music used throughout, are world-class violinists just beginning their rise to fame. But something's wrong. Kaylee's inability to communicate raises questions that need to be answered, and the resulting twist took most of the audience by surprise. A Paragon Falls is beautifully written. The sets are handsome, the music stunning, and the acting first-rate. This extremely moving play runs at the Wild Project. Uh, it definitely deserves a solid, happy face. Page 73 is doing Zora Howard Stew. It's a simmering play with tensions in a family of women boiling over as they prepare stew for some annual important church event that is never made clear. Mama the matriarch is stressfully trying to make the perfect stew while hollering orders at Nellie, Lillian, and Lil Mama. Everyone is yelling at each other to express concern over health relationships and other meaty matters. While the connections between the characters were somewhat confusing, because I wasn't sure if Nell was Lillian's sister or daughter, it didn't matter. The emotions expressed were so powerful and the acting off the charts that I was drawn into the drama even at the most cliché times. They made it feel as fresh as the ingredients put into the stew. And this is a family that's very proud of their dramatic and singing abilities. So when the youngest of the little mama is preparing to be in Little Richard, I mean Richard III, they all put in their two cents how to do it, which is a very clever use of a metaphor using Richard III. And Portia, when she does a quote from it at one point, my God, I was 
fine tingling. I mean, the acting was just, this was so good. I mean, Stu had all the other right ingredients for glee and sympathy. I wouldn't mind going back for second helpies just to figure out the significant endings. I'm giving it a happy face minus, but my gosh, this was good. Edward Einhorn, who's a really good friend of ours, and we've seen a lot of his plays over the years, has his most autobiographical and personal play at here, Doctors Jane and Alexander. It deals with uh, his mother, who's Dr. Jane. She was a psycho psychologist and artist, and um, her father, Edward's grandfather, who was a very famous blood doctor, who was one of the discoverers of the RH factor and also a very talented musician. He comes from a really great family, but there's a lot of pressure when you're from a family like this. And it's also very moving because it's based on a lot of interviews that Edward did. And after his mother's stroke uh, in 2005 and then later as she's gotten as she's deteriorated more. I found this incredibly moving, incredibly interesting, and you really felt like you got to know Edward um, even better. And he um, has this talented actor playing him who was sort of sitting on the stage at the beginning. And I was looking at it and I think, this guy's gotta be Edward. I think it was Max Wolkowitz. Wolkowitz. And the one who plays the mom, Alyssa Simon, is oh, a brilliant actress. Oh, she's a wonderful actress. I yeah. think I've seen her in Metropolitan Playhouse oh, okay. shows. Anyway, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like, I had no idea Edward had this like incredible background. And also, the way he explained this whole RH factor and everything mm. was really interesting. There's even like, a song that the grandfather wrote. Right, you know, and, and afterwards there was a talk back and there was somebody there who actually knew the, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff and was just like loved it. So you, you learn about your friend, you learn about science and you, you see a good show. I mean, this was... And his mom's paintings, there were some of them yeah, in the gorgeous. background. One of them looked one like, Matisse that it looked like I Matisse. would love. It looked yes. like a Matisse. I mean, yes. she, you know, I mean, my gosh, no wonder. He, I mean, he's got, that's why he does all It runs in the family. Yeah, that's why he does all those neurological plays, yeah. too. I mean, so, yeah, major happy face. Absolutely. I saw a couple plays at 59 is 59th Street. Lily Ackerman's The Commons is a common area where four random people are trying to live together without getting on each other's nerves, just the audiences. In a progression of scenes, the roommates complain of people not doing their share in cleaning, removing clutter, and how long guests can stay. It started out amusingly enough, but as it progressed, the characters became too inconsistent that I had no idea how to react to them. One minute, Robin is obsessively cleaning and going on about his sister, and then he abruptly stops caring about cleaning while the females are stuck doing dishes and cleaning beard hairs. Is this going to be about genders? The disparity of finances is brought up and dropped. Is this going to be about the classes? Age is briefly mentioned. Is this millennials versus 30 year olds? As it droned on and the characters became less appealing and time seemed to be stuck at seven months, I cared less and less about their petty problems. The acting was believable even if the characters weren't. And one note to the director, I was sitting in the, the front corner there and the guy was in front of me the entire time. He was standing there or sitting. I, I the sight lines don't have anyone sit there because you, you can't. I'm like you can't see anything. So I just felt that these roomies overstayed their welcome. I like the beginning, 15 minutes, mixed face minus. Rick Miller, boom at 5090s, which is the show you should definitely go see. Blends his baby boomer family history with the history of the times, utilizing projections, shadow lighting techniques, and impersonating some of the key figures. As Mr. Miller put it, a documentary about the baby boom generation, except instead of just editing and narrating it, I'm also going to be playing everyone in it. The, the idea is that by actually becoming my parents, I can experience what it was like for them to grow up at that time. With the amazing music, politics, and I want boomers in the audience to experience it again, too, and their children, and their grandchildren, like a living, breathing time cancel. Look beyond the how we change the world. It starts in 1945 with Perry Como singing until 1969 with Joe Cocker singing. Rick Miller is planning to make this a trilogy until present time, so we got a sample of the first part. 
Mr. Miller is an amazingly versatile performer and a damn good mimic. He illustrated this in his past show that I saw him do a decade ago called McHomer, where he had the Simpsons doing the damn Scottish play. It was brilliant. So, if you want to bring back memories of Forgotten Times with a look at it in a whole new light, as this is the Canadian version of Baby Boomers, then you should definitely go see this. Bam, you could see Simon Stone's contemporary version of the ancient tragedy Medea. It retells the story of the abandoned wife whose bloody revenge is still shocking today. Anna, the contemporary Medea played by Rose Byrne, returns home after time in a what I think was a penal mental institution for poisoning her errant husband Lucas, the modern Jason Bobby Cannavale. Although he has custody of their two sons, one of whom is a video filmmaker, and we see video projection of the family, um, he agrees to spend the night with Anna and the boys at her place to ease her back into life. This doesn't go over well with his new girlfriend, who's his boss's daughter, and Dylan Baker plays the boss. And eventually, Medea gets angrier and angrier and really lets loose. It's a white box kind of feeling with video projections. The performers are really good. I always knew Bobby Cannavale from stage. I never knew Rose Byrne. Just looking at the posters, I didn't think she would have the depth and the rage, but she does. I'm a little put off that they make her mentally ill instead of you know, super powerful. It seems like it's not as empowering to women as the original story was, but I like this a lot, and it's only 80 minutes. Maureen Taylor's Cosmic Connections, Connect the Dots or the Stars, is Six Degrees of Michael Colby, who is this incredibly clever and gifted lyricist, and she's going to do another show at Don't Tell Mamas on Tuesday on the 19th, and Really, it's like, th this is all his, uh, who he did with music people. He did Charlotte Sweet. He's done a million shows, and it's really good. And she's a lyric soprano, and it's really worth going. So go to Don't Tell Mamas and see this. And now for a lightning round of things that we're going to talk about on our next show, February 29th, because this goes till March 1st. Uh, Tom Dulac, has inspired by John Milton, is doing Paradise Lost, which is the Adam and Eve story and the fall of Lucifer, which I like more than Mark did. Now, Mark is going to talk about this one. Yes, um, Second Stage on Broadway has Best Walls, Grand Horizons, directed by Lee Silverman, and it's basically about Jane Alexander plays an 80-year-old woman who wants a divorce and how it affects her husband, who doesn't seem to be too bothered by it, but the kids are totally bent out of shape. I love her play Make Believe. I did not like this, even though it has a But we'll talk cast. about it on our next show. But in the meantime, you should go see Forbidden Broadway, because that's closing February 15th, and you know those parodies are just brilliant. And, and we both love this. Yes, and that seldom happens. We both love this, so endorse this. At the New Victory is Riddle of the Trilobites, which is directed by Lee Sunday Evans. It's an epic adventure story to save the trilobites from the changing ocean, part quest, part sword in the stone. It's the time of molting, a very special day for the trilobites. This is when it is revealed that young Aphra has a special markings that will save all the other trilobites. And with her sidekick and best friend, Judah Daya, she goes to her gossipy friend, Calliope, to help her solve the riddle of the trilobites. And they meet her aunt scientist, who sends her to the oldest uh, elder. And they end up in the southern reef, where she has to confront her oldest enemy. And all this... To, to save her people and make friends with the fish. And the acting was delightful. This was so much fun. It, it was hysterical. And there was even a Chekhovian joke that six people in the audience were cracking up over. Really, this is fun for everyone. Go see it. Unmask is playing at Paper Mill Playhouse, the music of Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I'm going to be showing you selections from that show, starting with Jesus Christ Superstar with Nicholas Edward.
Genuine's Review of Brocade. Set in Venice in 1650, Robert E. Donato's Brocade is not only funny, but also provides fascinating facts on the life of the underclass in 17th century Italy. Orazio is a talented young orphan raised in a convent by Mother Superior, formerly a countess, who was down and out because her family went broke. During his upbringing, he took up embroidery to help the nuns repair their habits. Thus, he grew up sewing and eventually developed into a first-class dress designer, or cutter as such people were known. But with no family connections, he was unable to join the Cutters Guild, meaning he was prevented from designing for people of quality. But talent will out. When the play begins, Orazio has become the favorite dressmaker for the 11,000 legal prostitutes in Venice. Um, will Orazio be able to break into a world that will acknowledge his great talent? Brocade is a clever, intelligent take on a time and place we can hardly imagine. It's a handsome production with fine sets, stunning costumes, lovely music, and first-class acting. It more than deserves a solid, happy face, which is what Jan gives it. Now we'll hear Buenos Aires Mamie Paris singing from Unmasked. And now to hear from Mamie Paris and Mauricio Martinez. To sing the old classics and, and some new ones. It's going to be really fun. Yes. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So besides Evita, what else are you singing? Um, I am singing, I'm doing a lot of Evita, which is really, really great. Um, I'm singing in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm doing the narrator, which is really fun because I've done that before and it's a blast. Uh, I am singing Memory. A lot of people have asked and I'm very excited about it. And then a lot of some new stuff, some new fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. And now for you, what do you get to sing? I get to sing Gethsemane, which is a beautiful it's challenge. Amazing. Oh, thank you. And uh, I also, obviously, Che. You know, um, that's like the, the role that I, I think <laughs> is the one that I, I identify the most, being a Latino. And, rum -tum -tum. and are you a rebel rouser? I am. Yes, I am a rebel <laughs> rouser. <laughs> and here's Rima Webb to sing every time we say goodbye from Sunset Boulevard. Jan Ewing's review. Jean Doby Geibel's intense drama, Chasing the River, concerns a young woman who returned to her childhood and home after serving a prison sentence for a crime which was widely misunderstood. Kat desperately needs to come to grips with her actions, which came about because of a severe history of domestic abuse. But such things are never easy, and as soon as she returns, she begins to be haunted by memories of people and events from her past. Like so many of us, Kat soon learns that it isn't easy to judge those who have wronged us, that our long-held beliefs are too often colored by our own emotions and misconceptions. Director Ella J. New and her talented cast have given us a fascinating study of PTSD. My only caveat is based on the time shifting, it became clear as to what was happening as the play progressed, but it began very early on, which I found somewhat confusing. Although the acting was absolutely first rate, because of this initial confusion, I give it a happy face minus. And the full Unmasked press conference with the interviews can be seen on our YouTube Eva Heinemann page.
Animal Farm will be on our Facebook page. Uh, Jan is going to see it. And I'm seeing Seesaw, an old musical that should be really good. Ebor City looked really interesting. I hope I can get to see that one. Uh, Jan is going to see Look Back in Anger. We'll talk more about Grand Horizons and Paradise Lost on our next show. And Miss America's Ugly Daughter that Mark is going to see. And Leslie DeLeo is in Forgotten Falls. So go see her in that. You know, our high drama people. I am over the moon excited. Mac and Mabel is my all-time favorite Jerry Harriman musical. I've seen it in Canada, London, everywhere. I love this show. It's about Mac Sennett and Mabel Norman, and it's brilliant. And Theater from the City is having their benefit, love, and courage, honoring James Rado from Hair. That's February 24th at 6 o'clock. And there's a benefit at Abingdon Theater. And the Fridge Festival starts October, uh, February 19th. All these wonderful plays, and we'll talk about that a lot on our next show, February 29th. Check out Scott Siegel and Marcy and Yank and Jeremy Jordan at 54 Below and Jamie DeRoy and Friends at Birdland. And the gorgeous Nothing Life Jacket, February 17th at Joe's Pub. Running out of time, so I have to go quickly. 92nd Street Y has Kevin Klein. On God Arts at La Mama looks very good. And at 14th Street Y, you can see uh, Planet Connection Festivities, Glory Cadigan, and Love Song by uh, Jose Rivera, which I'm going to February 11th. Go to YouTube, Eva Heinemann, Facebook, Twitter for more reviews. Don't forget to pick up your pro, pro, Performing Arts and Cultural Center. Performing Arts Insider Cultural Heartbeat in New York City next show, February 29th. And these shows were closed that you can find uh, reviews on the Facebook page. As soon as I Irene Shea. And also on the YouTube page, you can find uh, Romeo and Bernadette and Forbidden Broadway. More on that. 